my name is Kat, and today I'm going to be talking about The House of Hades by Rick Riordan! Alright, so I know I haven't made any videos for the other books in the series, but I just finished this one and I really want to talk about it, so I'm making this video first. Out of order. Deal with it. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about this book and the series with no spoilers, and then I'm going to go into a spoilery discussion because I have lots to say about this book. Also, I should probably mention that this video is going to be kind of rambly and incoherent, and you're probably going to see me blink because I'm not even going to bother trying to edit them out. It's probably going to be a very long, very blinky video. The elusive Katie-tastic eyelids. You will see them. You will. The House of Hades is the fourth book in the Heroes of Olympus series by Rick Riordan, which is a spin-off of the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series. Both of these series can be read separately from each other, but I do recommend reading the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series before this one. You don't have to, you can jump straight into The Lost Hero, which is book one. But I freaking love the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series, and I definitely recommend reading that one, and if you're gonna read both series anyways, you might as well read that one first. It's very difficult for me to talk about the plot of this book with no spoilers because I can't even discuss like what happens in this book without completely spoiling the end of the third book. So without spoilers, I can really only rave about how fantastic this series is. Rick Riordan is an amazing author. His writing is so strong and like action-packed and hilarious. Both of these series had me laughing out loud at points. Multiple points, I should say. And more so in the Heroes of Olympus series than the Percy Jackson series, you get a lot more, like, emotional impact. There's action and romance and humor and life and death stakes, and it's just a fantastic series, and I highly, highly recommend it to anyone who enjoys young adult or middle grade books anyone. Read it. If you haven't already, you need to start the series, or the Percy Jackson The Olympian series if you want to do that one first, but if you haven't read anything by Rick Riordan, you need to start now. And that is everything I can talk about without giving you any spoilers. So if you haven't read this book, then go away right now, because otherwise you are going to get spoiled, and it's better for you to read the book and experience it on your own. Spoilers happening in three, two, one, blast off! I have some notes. I took notes while I was reading. Basically, after each point of view section, I wrote like a couple sentences of notes, and now I'm going to kind of recap the book while discussing my favorite parts. So much happened in this book. I mean, first of all, we got point of view chapters from each of the seven, so there's a lot of main characters and a lot of stuff happening to each of them. I really, really loved that we flipped back and forth between Tartarus and, you know, non on Tartarus in between every like point of view segment and since Annabeth and Percy were the only ones in Tartarus that means we got to spend a lot of time with the both of them which was awesome because Percybeth is like important <laughs> yes my intelligent thoughts. So we start the book in Hazel's point of view with her meeting Hecate. Hecate shows Hazel all of these terrible potential futures and is like, without my help you're going to die. And then there's like a farting polecat. This is why I love Rick Riordan's books, because he'll take this scene that has so much like drama and tension and then he'll add a farting polecat and it just becomes perfection. So we get our little catch up with Hazel and the rest of the demigods and we kind of establish the story of how Hazel is going to need to learn how to control the mist and they need to make it to the house of Hades and Hecate is going to try to help them defeat this terrible giant. And then we go to Annabeth's point of view and Annabeth and Percy are falling into Tartarus still. They're falling! And then Annabeth says I love you to Percy as they're falling and I'm just like, oh, okay. We're doing this already, right? In the fields. Okay, okay. I'm fine, I'm fine. I, I can do this. I can handle this. And then they fall into the river and Annabeth and Percy are like trying to remember the goal, the dream of their future together to kind of make it out of this river of misery and despair and just feelings. So many feelings so soon in the book. Like, 
Rick Riordan, you, you, you. But they're together. Percy and Annabeth are together, and they're drinking fire, and they're all covered in blisters, and just things are bad, but they're together, and they're gonna stay together. They better stay together if they get separated in Tartarus. <laughs> then we're back up with the other demigods in Leo's point of view. My favorite part of this like point of view segment was when Jason comes flying in through the window like all heroic ready to rescue Leo and Leo already has the dwarves tied up and he's like wow you just wasted an awesome entrance. I also totally loved that Leo like sicked the dwarves on the Romans like go get them! Go make their lives hell for a little bit. That would be great. And then we're back in Percy's point of view with him and Annabeth in Tartarus and at this point they're still just kind of trying to survive and get to the right place or at least head in that direction like what what else are they gonna do there's one way out of Tartarus and that is through the doors so they're following the vampires until they realize the vampires have discovered them enter Bob the Titan with his giant broom his broomerang that was a great line broomerang <laughs> Bob the Titan thinks that he and Percy are friends even though Percy was the one who destroyed his memory and we'll see how how that comes to bite us in the ass later. But at least for now, Percy and Annabeth have Bob the Titan to kind of help them along on their journey. And then we go to Frank's point of view. Frank is hearing voices, specifically the voices of Mars and Ares in his head, kind of battling each other, and it's driving him a little bit crazy. These war gods are worse than Coach Hedge, they just want to kill everyone. I love how, like, crazy and hilarious all of these minor gods and goddesses are and the major ones for that matter, but it's just so amusing to see how Rick Riordan kind of adapts these gods and goddesses into the modern world. Like the Triptolemus Farming University courses online, like that's, that's hilarious. But yeah, the best part of this point of view section was definitely Frank becoming a badass. Like running through the city and rounding up all of these cow demon monsters and then slaying them all. That was so cool! I've really been loving Frank's transformation, not just in this book, but over the course of the series. I mean, particularly by the end of this book where he's like the praetor and he's so buff and like just in charge now like he has really come into himself and it's been such an awesome transformation to see from the beginning where he's so like kind of meek and not really confident and now here he is like he is the son of Mars oh yes he is and then we're back to Tartarus in Annabeth's point of view with her and Percy and Bob the Titan and small Bob we come across Hyperion for the first time in this book and this is where we kind of crank up the tension a little bit because what happens if Bob remembers that Percy is the one who destroyed his memory that would be bad the last thing that Percy and Annabeth need right now is for their titan companion to turn on them. And the second to last thing that Annabeth and Percy need right now is to be mobbed by a bunch of fury-like creatures who are going to sling curses at them. Which is exactly what happens. Except there's a cliffhanger. Cause Rick Riordan loves his cliffhangers even within a book. Chapter cliffhangers. Sometimes he does that, like right here. Percy and Annabeth are in deep trouble, but oh, let's go see what Hazel's doing. So we move into the next Hazel point of view section, where they are getting attacked by a giant turtle. Also, Coach Hedge is acting kind of suspicious. At this point of the story, I was actually really, really worried about this. I was certain that Coach Hedge was up to something far more sinister than what actually he was up to. Like, I thought he might be communicating with the evil sorceress that Hazel was supposed to fight at the end, like maybe he was on her side and he was gonna betray them, but thankfully that didn't happen. Hedge just knocked up his cloud girlfriend, however that works. I was also totally with Hazel when she was climbing up the mountain with Jason and she was like, 
I can't really get a grip on this guy. Like, who is Jason? What is he capable of? I mean, we haven't even had a Jason point of view chapter since book one, The Lost Hero. And, you know, for the most part of that book, he didn't even know who he was. So how are we supposed to know who he is? And then after Hazel has outsmarted Skyon, we get a brief moment of Hazel and her father together. You know, Hades has a really bad reputation, but seriously, he does not seem as bad as some of these other gods and goddesses. So after Hazel's little mini reunion with her father, we head back to Tartarus where Percy and Annabeth are about to get cursed. Bob the Titan realizes that Percy is the one who made his memory go away so he's not helping them anymore. I can just imagine how difficult that would be for Percy to ha see like Annabeth helpless and blind and suffering and believing that he abandoned her. Ah. Uh, thankfully, though, thankfully, Bob the Titan comes through and decides to help them, but Percy is not in great shape at the moment, and things aren't looking so hot for them. And then we go to Jason's point of view. So the first thing that happens in Jason's point of view section is a dream of Grover and Rachel Elizabeth Dare delivering Annabeth's message to Reyna. That's a lot of characters in one sentence. Finally, Jason is good for something! I actually find myself liking Reyna a lot in this book. Not just for this scene, but also the scene at the end, which I'll talk about at the end. But yeah, Reyna is a badass. Octavian, not so much. Octavian is a little shit, and he needs to be backhanded. Then Jason's point of view section continues to be good for something, because then we get to learn some stuff about Nico. Okay. Okay. Who saw this coming? Who who theorized that this was going to happen? Because I didn't. Nico has a crush on Percy. Okay! The moment Favonius said, the one you care for most plunged into Tartarus. I just started freaking out a little bit. That was a very interesting lack of a pronoun there. And, you know, Nico's being all shady about it, and Jason's like, what's the big deal? He has a crush on Annabeth. No! No, he doesn't! Oh my god, Nico has a crush on Percy! Like, does that shock you? I did not see that coming, but... I was very pleasantly surprised by it. It adds such a new, interesting aspect to the story, and... Oh, Nico's journey, his character journey, like, wow. But yeah, after that revelation, we return to Percy and Annabeth in Tartarus, in Annabeth's point of view. We meet the giant Damason, Thomason. I can't pronounce anything in this book. He is the anti-Ares giant the anti-war giant, so he is very peaceful, and hence he is kind of banished into Tartarus. He's cursed to live in the swamp and to kill the same Dracon day after day after day. It was really, really nice, though, to have some positive Persebeth moments, like Annabeth and Percy cuddled in the bed together, like, Finally, they have found, like, the single safe spot in Tartarus for them to both sleep together not sleep together. This is a children's book. And Annabeth kind of realizes that Damason and Bob are the foes bear arms part of the prophecy, and they need both of them to come along on the journey to the doors. But Damason doesn't want to go. He's gonna stay there even though he misses the sky and the stars. He just, he doesn't know how to change his fate, so he stays there, and Annabeth and Percy and Bob and Small Bob move along without him. Then we get a Piper point of view section. And I just knew that that snow biatch was gonna return, the snow goddess. I hate her. And her brother, that this is such a creeper. Like, Creeper status alert. But it was so very cool when Piper was still able to use charm speak to her advantage, even though obviously Kione, Kion, whatever her name is, she isn't going to be falling for Piper's charm speak. But Piper does the charm speak onto Festus and like 
tells him that he is alive, and then Festus is back up, and oh, that was great. I really, really loved the Festus and Leo relationship in the first book, and I was so excited when this happened, and I was like, oh man, how is Leo gonna react? But, you know, Leo was flown off the ship, and we don't know where he is, except I, we do, because I've already read the book, and we'll talk about that in a minute, because that's another one of my, like, favorite aspects of this entire book. Then we're back in Tartarus, in Percy's point of view, and this is the part where Percy was kind of scary. They were fighting Aklis, Aklis, the, like, misery goddess lady, and parts of that fight were, like, kind of lighthearted and funny, like, you know, you're typical Percy Jackson fair. They realize that complimenting her kind of drives her crazy, so they're like, you're fantastic, you're so beautiful, you're so confident, and she's like, ah! But when Percy started controlling the poison and like smothering her and choking her, like, that was a little terrifying, Percy. Let's be real. Some things shouldn't be controlled, and smothering someone with poison is probably one of those things. I mean, I totally get his perspective. Like, he's in Tartarus, and him and Annabeth are in danger, and you are not going to hurt Annabeth, so choke on some poison. It was kind of scary seeing that darkness in Percy, and seeing that darkness, like, become so present and forefront of his actions. But after Percy being scary, we move into a much nicer, happier kind of scene. Leo lands on Calypso's island, and from the moment they see each other and instantly dislike each other, I was in love. The denial between them is just so wonderfully hilarious. Like, Thou doth protest too much. Seeing Leo and Calypso, like, they hate each other at first, and then they start to warm up to each other, and the flirting, and it's all just so adorable. What are we calling this relationship? Is it Kaleo or Leopso? Because I don't care what we call it, I love it so much. You know, until the end of the section where uh, as soon as Calypso, like, really falls for Leo, that stupid f***ing raft comes. Oh, I was so bummed out when Leo left. Like, ah, uh, I was so convinced that Leo and Calypso were going to be able to leave together, and, you know, the raft showed up that they would both get on it, and they would both go, and they would make it out, but... That didn't happen. Leo ended up leaving without her, and it was so heartbreaking, but he made that oath that he would return, and he would get her off the island, and oh my gosh, I, I need that to happen in the fifth book, please. Please, please, please. Back in Tartarus, Annabeth and Percy are facing off against Nyx, the knight. This is why Annabeth is such a great character, because she's so clever and she just, she's good at thinking in the moment. Pretty much anything else they would have done at that point would have gotten them killed. But instead, she kind of goes for the weakness of many gods and goddesses, and that is their pride. Nyx is like totally offended that she's barely mentioned in the Taurus brochure and then everyone's like clamoring for attention and a photo op and Percy and Annabeth are able to escape and run through the very dark scary mansion and make it to the other side and then stuff starts really happening. We go back to another Jason point of view and I find it really interesting that Jason is like becoming more Greek and you know Nico came out as having a crush on Percy and now Jason's coming out as being Greek. Just everyone's coming out. This little section was kind of like the calm before the storm. You know we get reunited with Leo and all of our heroes are ready to go into action and Jason is preparing to like sacrifice himself. Everyone, everyone in this book is so damn noble. Like that's why they're the heroes because everyone's just so self-sacrificing and noble and we're heading to the house of Hades like here we are the ending it's coming and what is gonna happen who's gonna die 
who's gonna die? Someone, someone's probably gonna die. We go back into Percy's point of view, and him and Annabeth have arrived at the doors. They're with Bob and Small Bob, and there are monsters and titans and giants all over the place. Percy is getting all noble. He's about to get his self-sacrifice on. Like, Annabeth thinks they're both about to jump in and go up, and Percy thinks just Annabeth is gonna go in, and he's gonna hold the button. And then, even this terribly crappy plan goes awry, because here comes Tartarus in a body incarnation thing, and he is going to honor Percy and Annabeth by killing them himself. Yay! Meanwhile, up in the House of Hades, above Percy and Annabeth, Frank and the rest of the demigods are just being swarmed by monster after monster. And again, we have an awesome Frank scene, because Frank is just like becoming this total badass warrior. Jason gives up his title as Praetor to Frank, and here's Frank just directing this massive army of dead skeleton warrior ghostly soldier things and just kicking ass while doing so. And then we go to our last section in Tartarus. We're in Annabeth's point of view. Annabeth and Percy can't really fight Tartarus because He's Tartarus and he's going to destroy them. But then Bob and Small Bob are like fighting him off and none of the other monsters are really interfering because they're just like, holy crap, Tartarus, what are you doing here? And then Damison comes in on his Dracon and he's like taking everyone out and he's like, Annabeth, I changed my fate. Here's Bob and Damison and they're essentially going to sacrifice themselves so that Percy and Annabeth can get out and <sighs> They're never gonna see the stars. Bob! Bob isn't gonna see the stars! And this is just where I started crying. Annabeth and Percy get in the elevator and they're holding the door shut, trying to keep them closed as they're going up, and oh my goodness, I'm just bawling. And then we get into Hazel's section where now it's Hazel's turn to just be a badass using the mist to kind of direct the battle to her likings. They defeat that sorceress Pacify and the giant Clytius and everyone is reunited and it's so like temporarily happy and they're all together and everyone's alive and this is where I start panicking because there's still another section of point of view left and um who's gonna die what's gonna happen what what do you have in store for us now Rick Riordan what are you gonna do now and surprisingly the answer is nothing like we actually have a nice happy ending happy-ish I mean as happy as you can get in this series with all this stuff going down. Everyone gets reunited and Reyna is there and again Reyna is a total freaking badass and I'm so sad about her horse Scipio skips whatever his name is oh he died he didn't make it that was sad it was just like a passing sentence but I was like oh you're horsey. We end the book with just a whole bunch of like uh, kind of set up for what's going to be happening in the next book and I'm really really so excited for it. In the next book everything is going to go down like Reyna and Nico and Coach Hedge are taking the Athena statue back to camp which by the way do you guys think we're gonna get point of view from one of those characters? I think we might get a Nico point of view chapter or Maybe, maybe Reyna, maybe Nico. I hope it's Nico. I hope it happens. I'm also very, very worried about who is going to die because for Gaia to raise, two demigods need to die and I think that that's going to happen. I think two of the seven are going to die, one boy, one girl, and Gaia is going to be raised and then they're gonna defeat her. I think that's gonna happen but I don't know who's gonna die, and I'm really, really nervous and worried about that. But yeah, let me know what you thought. This was my favorite book of the series so far. I loved it, and I'm so happy we got a somewhat peaceful ending where we can kind of leave our characters in peace for a year before book five comes along and destroys us all. That's my theory, that's my prediction. Book five, everyone's gonna die. I don't mean the characters, I mean the readers. Rick Riordan is gonna kill us all with feels and stress. 
it could happen. I love this book. I love this series. I love Rick Riordan in a love-hate kind of way because he does things to my emotions that make me not form words. That's what he does. That's what he does. But yeah, that is everything I had for this video today. So thank you so much for watching it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have a great night and I will have another video soon. So I will see you then. Goodbye.